in fact, I just remember that the first time I was uh, here in New York, uh, it was precisely on, on the 10th of November 2007 um, that I, hopefully I didn't give the same line, <laughs> but <laughs> I could see that there, is a, that there is a continuation between what I said at that time and uh, what I would like to share with you, with you today. In a way, speaking last is always uh, pretty useful because uh, the friends who spoke first uh, laid the foundations of what I'm going to say. And, and the thing that Mary's uh, uh, presentation today was great because uh, she basically defined uh, the space where we, we live in. And uh, it, it reminded me of what a, a very good friend of mine told me many years ago, saying that we are responsible for, I mean, many things are happening around us, but fundamentally we are responsible for what we put in our own consciousness. That's the space that we basically are responsible for. And I think that was, uh, Mary's presentation was very important because it reminded us that, uh, you know, we can put in our consciousness uh, little things, but also we can put in our consciousness the universe uh, and uh, the direction that it brings. So I, I think that this is a fundamental uh, uh, image to, to keep in, in my mind. And then also Steve, uh, Steve was were very helpful because uh, they did describe uh, um, in a symbolic way the dynamics uh, of what happens uh, within that space. Uh, and the dynamics are often something that, uh, you know, is a bit forgotten. Uh, but in reality, the, the dynamics, the, the way they work, uh, they define uh, how we are or we can define them. So it's, uh, we need to enter into, the re into resonance precisely with those dynamics to be able to express ourselves, but also become uh, a very active partner of that universe that uh, Mary has uh, uh, described for us. So what I, what I would like to do uh, with you today is uh, to share a few words about uh, um, international cooperations, which is uh, the field where I'm very grateful for having uh, the experience of my professional life, but, but beyond the profession is something that I truly and genuinely believe in. Uh, <clears throat> and I would like to give you maybe a, a little clue with uh, uh, the title of the presentation, which came out uh, uh, in a very spontaneous way on a very early morning. And then when I thought, how on earth am I define myself by that title? So it, it pushes me to think through what I really had to, uh, what I really had to say. And uh, the reason for that title is simply that when I hear about cooperation, I normally, or international cooperation, I, I always feel described uh, from different angles. Um, sometimes the cooperation is presented as a good thing, you know, something that if it is there is good, and if it is not, okay, I'll keep plowing and I'll keep going forward. Uh, something that, you know, I, I, can, I can do without. Uh, some other times, uh, cooperation is presented as something that must happen, uh, is an expectation, uh, so I live with that expectation that others cooperate with me, and it's interesting because also in international law, uh, the duty to cooperate is actually a fundamental pillar of our, uh, of our world order. Um, some other times, and probably most of the time, uh, cooperation is presented as something that, I, that we need. You know? when, when we want to achieve something, uh, whether it is for our own personal interest or even for higher aspirations, we really believe that cooperation is something that we need. And, and therefore, we, we, um, we look for that. And also that approach, I think, is very interesting, although it's also a little bit uh, utilitaristic, if, if, I may, if I may so. So I was lo looking at whether there are other angles, in fact, that can describe uh, um, what cooperation is uh, without those uh, uh, conditionalities. And uh, in fact, uh, when we move out of the, the human kingdom, as again, as uh, Mary told us today, cooperation is just a fact. It just exists. Um, it's simply the way life uh, conduct itself, the way life uh, creates new forms, creates ever increasingly intelligent and complex forms, and, uh, and the way it's building uh, societies, uh, the planets and, and the universe. So from that perspective, then, uh, 
I thought that uh, in, in, our, in our lives, in, in, in the human kingdom, it feels that we have lost that automatism to cooperate. And uh, so that is something that triggered in my mind a, a series of questions, which I, I'm going to share with you uh, today. Um, in fact, uh, what I would really like to, to discuss with you is the question of uh, uh, international cooperation, open it up a little bit, uh, because international cooperation uh, is, uh, is a kind of new concept uh, in, uh, in, our planetary, uh, in our planetary life in terms of human, human beings. In, in, international cooperation was born fundamentally with the, with the United Nations in, 19, uh, in 1945. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it, it has become uh, something very common in our, in our discourse. Uh, and we know that when things are a, a, a bit too common, uh, they tend to lose traction, they tend to lose uh, energy, we tend to lose uh, the meaning that they, have, uh, that they have behind. And in fact, uh, I don't think it's by coincidence that nowadays uh, many say that international cooperation is at stake. Uh, there's a lot of concerns about the fact that the world is abandoning multilateralism, that's the way the political scientists call it, uh, toward new approaches which, has a very, which have a very uh, individualistic uh, um, accent. And in fact, uh, um, a few days ago um, at the United Nations, there have been two very interesting meetings that I was really privileged to, uh, to be able to, to witness. Uh, the first one was, was a meeting where the... Uh, the President of the General Assembly with the President of the Economic and Social Council with the President of the Security Council basically convened a, a, a conversation on uh, multilateralism. Um, and again, uh, yesterday, within the Security Council, there was another conversation about multilateralism and its meaning for uh, the current uh, peace and security on, on, on the planet. And it's interesting because those, uh, those uh, two dialogues were fundamentally characterized by a strong, a strong restatement towards multilateralism, towards the value of the United Nations, uh, toward the, the, the value of having a world order based on, on, on law and, and, and the rule of law. Um, a, a, a place where the United Nations was recognized as being uh, literally at the cornerstone of, of the current uh, uh, historical, historical period. Uh, at the same time, of course, uh, uh, many were the challenges that were presented into that, uh, in those two dialogues. Uh, and uh, again, there was quite interesting because uh, I could almost classify those, uh, the, those um, considerations in, in, in two perspectives. Some of them were very interesting from a, a, a geopolitical uh, point of view, uh, whether are others were more uh, of a human nature. Some of the comments were just something that relates to, to anybody, regardless whether you, have a, a, you are a political scientist or not. And uh, those were the points that struck me the most because I thought they were fundamentally underpinning uh, uh, those conversations and were something very simple, something that we are all very familiar with, is the capacity to dialogue, confidence building, mutual respect, equality, inclusivity, the necessity to overcome our divisions, the needs for mentality changes, you know, the, the problems that arise with abuse of powers, bias, double standards, capacity and willingness to take on responsibilities. So something very, very normal, I would say, something very, at the same time, very human, very deep in us. And uh, while I was listening to those, uh, to those exchanges, uh, uh, it dawned on me a very, a very simple question. I mean, why there is so much talk uh, about uh, international cooperation at the international level when uh, in fact, uh, then at the national level, we tend to speak more in terms of international relations. So we move from cooperation to relations and how those relations in fact uh, uh, affect my life or our life. You know, how a country is behaving toward my country and vice versa. So we shift from international cooperation to looking at things from a perspective of uh, uh, international relations 
And then I realized that even more, uh, even less uh, space uh, is devoted to simple discussion just about cooperation at our, you know, in our nations, but also within our communities, within, within our cities. It's, it's very rare to be engaged in a conversation about cooperation. And I was thinking, why is that? I mean, isn't cooperation something that is fundamentally uh, important uh, at all levels? Is it important at the international level, but it's also important in our, daily, uh, in our daily life, in our communities and cities? And I was thinking, how on earth we can expect uh, nations to cooperate if we, as individuals, have difficulties in doing it? Uh, Either we don't cooperate or we do it with some, uh, with some challenges. I mean, how can we expect uh, uh, our nations, if we as people and citizens, don't give guidance to our governments uh, to enter into constructive uh, international cooperation? It's, it's as simple as that. I mean, uh, that guidance must emerge uh, from carefully thought through ideas and concepts which are based not just on pure imaginations, that are based on imagination, yes, on daily practice, and also probably our divine, uh, divine instinct. In fact, uh, I come to realize that these often invoked new forms of cooperation, and I, and I put the accent on the word form, can, they can really go as far as my consciousness can go. So I can invent uh, all sorts of different mechanics, but if fundamentally me as an individual, I don't resonate to them, those forms will never actually work uh, uh, efficiently. And, and together with that goes another point, which is more, are we ready to, uh, to accept a shared responsibility for the current world situations, regardless whether we believe that we have contributed to create it, because from that perspective, then it emerges the energy that is necessary to get the shared responsibility for action. So the two things actually go quite uh, hand in hand. So I really wonder whether in general there is a need just to speak more about cooperation and not just as a beautiful thing, because sometimes, I mean, it, if somebody doesn't speak well about cooperation, he's immediately pointed a finger at. Uh, it's like bad to speak badly about cooperation. And I think that we need to demystify that as well, because uh, we know that cooperation brings challenges, and I think it's very healthy to speak about the challenges that cooperation brings, because until and unless we open that up, we, 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 we live in a sort of a, a non-true perspective, or, or we tend to seclude, we tend to put in a closed box, in a Pandora box, in a way, uh, the challenges that, in fact, our personalities must face when it enters into um, relations with, the, with others. And it is important because then, if we are able to have a conversation about the challenges of cooperation, then, of course, we also immediately identify ways to uh, to overcome them. Um, so what is cooperation? You know, what does it entail uh, and require from me as an individual? Have we ever asked ourselves that question? And, and I think that is not, only, uh, is not a question that we can ask ourselves only once to be able to, to answer that. It's a question that needs to come from us, sometimes needs to come from a friend, sometimes from my wife in different ways. <laughs> Uh, so it's, it's important to keep, uh, to keep pondering on it. And then, uh, you know, how does cooperation need to change uh, in, in the face of societal changes? Then uh, I think that there is another important dimension in all this, is uh, why the focus is fundamentally and most of the time on cooperations amongst humans. That is probably like 99.9% of, of, of the times that we speak about cooperation. I mean, can we really segregate a discourse on cooperation within a given kingdom? Or is, in fact, that is fa simply fallacious and inaccurate for the very same fact that we live on a planet where there are different kingdoms. So 
speak about cooperation within one only, it's probably not that, uh, uh, not that correct because we do belong to a, a larger entity which is giving us uh, life as a whole. Now this leads me to another point which is uh, that there seems to be a gap um, and therefore a bridge to be built uh, between the whole of humanity and us as individuals, but also between uh, humanity and other kingdoms of, uh, um, of nature. And in, in a way, when I reflect and ponder on the, on the consciousness of humanity as a whole, I think that the idea of cooperation is more present in, in, the, in the macro picture than in the small one of my own consciousness. Uh, the UN Charter, I think, is a very clear example of that. And the UN Charter does mark a fundamental turning point in the history of humanity. It's not just a great document in legal and geopolitical terms. It's a great document that speaks to the consciousness of, uh, of people. And in fact, when you compare the United Nations Charter to other international agreements that have been uh, you know, drafted and, and adopted throughout the centuries, if not millennia, the United Nations Charter introduces a fundamental new concept, which is the International Cooperation for Development. What does that mean? It means that as, as a community of nations, but as with the people of the United Nations, we have undertaken to care for the development of the planet. We have agreed on it. It's a fundamental act of will, if I can put it in that, uh, uh, in that way. So we deliberately chose uh, not simply to protect ourselves from the scourge of war, but we decided to develop time, energy, and attention to develop uh, ourselves and the planet where we live in. Now, why does that, I mean, that happened in 1945, and, and, and I was wondering just why that happened in 1945 uh, instead of uh, 948 uh, or 3620. Why in 1945? Now, I don't really know the reason for that, but I can guess that that, that certainly means uh, a something. And, and I take the, the, United, the founding of the United Nations and the United Nations Charter really as, a, as an, interesting, an interesting sign of the liveliness uh, of humanities. A, it was a momentous moment, if I can play with, uh, uh, with words, in the history of humanity. And it does signal a, a potential that in a way still awaits to enter into full uh, manifestations and application. Here, these are the things. Now, we normally, we tend to commensurate life with our lives. Uh, and therefore, something that happened 73 years ago, you know, may sound a little bit old, a little bit passé. But of course, if you are 73 years old, you don't believe that. <laughs> right? And that is exactly the spirit and the energy that we need to, to evoke. The United Nations Charter is not 73 years old, it's 73 years young. And there is something there that is still awaiting to, to, be, fully, uh, to be fully understood. 73, year, 73 years in the history of humanity is less than a blink of an eye, it's, it's just nothing. And, and so that is again, uh, where the also importance of the presentation of Mary is how we can commensurate our lives and our being with something that normally seems much bigger, and it is in a way much, much bigger, but it's not a dimension that can escape us. We can embrace it, in fact. So my claim is fundamentally that the, the UN Charter is not only is not passé, but I would say that it's probably very little understood and this is not, again, in geopolitical terms or in legal terms, because there you have beautiful books and commentaries uh, written on, on, on the different aspects of the work of the United Nations Charter. But I think that uh, 
It is, what is still little understood is what it means for us as individuals. And uh, how do I need to challenge myself uh, in order to understand uh, what the purposes and principles of the United Nations Charter really means for me and what actually I am expected to do, what I can do in order to translate them into, uh, into reality. You know, how can I overcome my personality, my habits, my thoughts, my, my biases, and so on and so forth, in order to bring that charter into a reality? Because I think it's a fundamental an illusion if I do expect uh, nations to do it, if I can't do it. It's almost a bit arrogant even, I would say. Um, and that is, uh, brings me to, uh, to consider that the United Nations is not only an, inst an, an, an interesting instrument from a, from a geopolitical uh, point of view, I think is a great psychological tool. Why is that? Because uh, in, in a way the United Nations and its work is like a mirror where we see ourselves reflected on and we can see actually what's happening uh, within us, if we are ready to, uh, to open our eyes. Uh, but also, it is like a magnifying lens, because uh, being projected on a macro scale, it becomes easier to see some of the challenges that exist uh, within ourselves. So we can use the United Nations not only as an instrument to, to improve the world uh, conditions, uh, but also as an instrument to, to better understand who I am, how I behave in the dynamics that Steve was uh, earlier uh, describing. So my, my, my invitation is fundamentally not to take the United Nations Charter for granted and not to take uh, uh, international cooperation for development for granted and clear, because uh, there is still a lot that must be unveiled. And uh, that unveiling uh, is fundamentally related to an understanding, and that understanding will grow depending on how much time and energy and dedication I put into understanding it. If I don't do it, I don't, I don't get it. So it's, 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 it's finding the time in our daily lives to understand how those precepts and principles can be applied by me in my daily, uh, in my daily relations. And uh, fundamentally, my, my capacity to, to translate those purposes and principles into, in, in, into actions. Um, in a way, cooperation uh, by default goes beyond the consciousness of an individual. And it takes us uh, a, a bit of a courage uh, because we need to cross a border fundamentally. And, uh, and, and that border takes us into other spaces. And, and uh, so we are entering, in a way, into an unknown space that can be discovered only if I actually cooperate with others. Because it's the relation between me and the other person or the other persons. But I need to cross that border that is my own, my own uh, being. And uh, by doing that, then is where we start transcending the, uh, the particular interest. In, in, in a way, I think uh, it's interesting because it's, uh, it's appreciating the difference between cooperating to get something done versus cooperating to allow and then figure out what needs to be done. It's a different, it's a different perspective, if, if I can say so. And that's why cooperation seems to create a whole new space altogether. So cooperating creates a space. Now, cooperation seems to be, in a way, more an attitude, a predisposition, or a quality that we can develop uh, rather than a modality to carry out the task. And uh, in a way, then cooperation is also freed by, uh, from blackmailing, if I can put it in that way. Because it's not that I cooperate if you cooperate. 
We enter into a new space, into a new paradigm. So cooperation becomes almost like a quality of life that can be injected in our own daily lives. It's our choice. In that sense, cooperation can also be seen as an artistic, a cultural, and also a scientific expression of, uh, of, a, of a human consciousness. How's that? The art of cooperation, that can be an inspired and inspiring way of living which contributes to manifest the higher qualities of our consciousness. You know, the sense of beauty, the sense of harmony, the sense of relations, the sense of proportions, the sense of, you name it. The science of cooperation that is the result of the manifestation of, and of diligent study, sorry, and application of the laws and principles that uh, govern our consciousness. And, and we apply them, uh, you know, in, in, in our daily life, in our daily uh, interactions. And then the culture of cooperation, which is the constant adjustment of our ethics and daily practices, to the new value, which then create the civilization and the future that we are going to live in, characterized by goodwill and will to good. Now, I'm sure that uh, all of us have experienced those moments in life where we need to make sense of things in our own space, in our own daily life. Now, we know that those moments are quite interesting. We also know that we cannot make sense of things uh, all the time. There are only certain times where we can make sense of things. The times have to be ripe for that. And when we, and when we make sense of things, so, you know, we know that we give them focus, direction, purpose, it's a, it's, it's, it's a very peculiar, it's a very peculiar moment. It's a moment in which we give the different elements and the whole a meaning. So we value things for what they are in their own individuality, but as we're making sense of them, we also give meaning to the whole that they characterize. These are moment, important moments of synthesis. These are also important moments in which uh, a cycle opens and closes. In a way, these are foundational moments of our, of our existence. And, and genuinely, I really believe that this is one of those moments, but on a planetary scale. Now, over the past 73 years, a few spectacular and unprecedented things have happened. The forging, the forging of a planetary plan based on an agreement, that is the United Nations Charter. We know that an agreements are an expression of will. Uh, an incredible development, unprecedented level of development of international law to address complex issues. The number of sovereign states has triplicated. The number of governments has triplicated. The number of associations and private entities, countless. My impression is that uh, over the past 73, hours, 70, 73 years, and it's still happening, there has been a massive explosion of will. And uh, let alone that over the past 200 years, we have moved from being 1 billion community to 7.6 billion. That is a lot of will to deal with. Huge. And that is also a huge force and resource that is at disposal. Now, the world has become, again, using political scientists, multipolar. And in fact, it's true. It's a multiplicity of centers of will that are just blossoming, coming up everywhere. 
that is not a small thing. It's extremely meaningful, in fact. And this can also mean, probably, if it's up for reflection, that the traditional ways of using will, exercise it, may no longer be applicable or may no longer be that useful. So we are witnessing on a daily basis the challenges that come from a multipolar societies for our governments, from the way power is used and exercised. And is a challenge to a model that uh, started around 2,500 years ago. So that's why opening and closing of cycles. And it's also related to the larger number that you Mary er mentioned earlier. Now, if that is the case, uh, then probably this requires the search of a new paradigm, a new channel on how we can use that will and bring it to bear to the further evolution of humanity and the planet. Uh, because there's a lot of will that is coming into existence, that is coming into manifestation through this countless number of uh, uh, organizations and also individuals. So the test that we are facing, I think, is one of the use of the collective will of group will. So how to forge a truly collective will out of individual wills? And the question is whether cooperation is the tool to find that new paradigm for the use of the collective will, for a continued then evolution of our, our communities, our society, but also the planet as a, as, a, as a whole. Now, we know that to live a life characterized by a cooperative note uh, is certainly not an easy question at all and should not be taken lightly. That's why I said earlier, we need to be brave enough to question cooperation. We need to be brave enough to, to see what it means for us uh, and whether I'm really ready or there's a few things that I need to work on in order to become an increasingly more effective cooperative being. We know that uh, there's a lot of concerns, there's a lot of fears, and the international discourse, the national discourse, are characterized by those concerns and fears. So we, we, we just need to open the newspapers in every, in every single country. Uh, and I really believe that uh, it's important for us to reflect uh, on the fact that those fears and concerns in reality belongs only to certain parts of ourselves. Why do I say that? Because uh, our body cells, our parts, they seem to be quite happy to cooperate. In fact, if they didn't, our bodies would not be in existence. So, some parts of our being have a bit of a problem with cooperation, but others actually are quite fine with it. <laughs> That's a good thing. It means that we are on the right way. <laughs> <laughs> now, how can we overcome these concerns and these fears or these challenges? Well, the answer is pretty easy. We, first, we must want it. And now, here, here is the paradox of the will. Wills can be extremely divisive, but also wills is what bring us to synthesis and harmony. And there, there, there are, there, there were cutting edge studies uh, on, in psychology, such as those of Roberto Assagioli, who many of you will, uh, will know, who developed psychosynthesis, who pointed out the functions and the qualities of the will and, what, and how the will plays a role in our life and what that role is and how to exercise it and how to use it, how to get to know it. And those studies, they basically particularly stress the harmonizing functions that they will place in our lives and they brings into the, uh, in the, in the way the different parts and the different components of our self actually manifest themselves. Now, Interestingly enough, there is an article in the United Nations Charter which is spot on on this specific point, is Article 1. Now, Article 1 has uh, 
four separate points, four paragraphs. The first three paragraphs are about things to do, are about things to be achieved, which are peace and security, friendly relations among states, and uh, you, the respect and promotion of human rights, I'm summarizing this, or international cooperations to address challenges of economic, social, cultural, and humanitarian nature. Paragraph four is of a different nature. Paragraph four, and they quote it, it says, to be a center, so it's not to do, but to be a center for harmonizing the actions of nations in the achievement of these common ends. Now, interestingly enough, this is probably the least commented article of the United Nations Charter. So there is something there not to be taken into account. So from this perspective, the United Nations can be seen as a massive and unprecedented experiment at a planetary scale for the harnessing of individual wills, and those individual wills are states, civil society, private sectors, individuals, you name it, harmonizing those individual wills, bring them into a synthesis of some sort and a synthesis that goes beyond the parties themselves, and give this collective will purpose, directions, and application for the improvement of life on Earth. As an experiment, it may be fallacious, of course. But at the same time, I think that it needs the time and dedication that every experiment requires. And we need to learn from scientists. Scientists will not enter into an experiment with a lukewarm heart. A, a, a scientist will go full on uh, in, uh, in it. We start with passion, not reservations. So in, in a way, it's, I think it's very critical to keep alight the flame uh, of enthusiasm when uh, we are aware that we are conducting such an experiment, unprecedented experiment in the history of, uh, uh, of humanity. Now, international cooperation is an incredible idea. It is not fully established practice yet, we know it. Uh, but at the same time, it is critical that we keep studying and applying ourselves uh, to become those individuals who can actually make a difference. But it requires self-training, self-education, constantly, daily practice. Now, and here there is another paradox emerging that uh, cooperating for a shared objectives, interestingly enough, has also an, a, a, a implanted in it an element of competition. And that competition is with reaching the objective. Uh, but cooperating for the sake of cooperation, in fact, uh, opens up a new, a, new, a new dimension, a new something else that, you know, it's not very clear what it is, but there is something that is, is worth uh, uh, exploring. And then, of course, uh, that also brings other fears, you know, uh, the fears of being exploited. If I'm too nice, maybe somebody else will take advantage of me. Uh, but that's fine. That shouldn't stop us from, uh, from entering that space. And also, interestingly enough, and I think that uh, uh, it was in the opening uh, uh, remarks uh, that you made, <laughs> that fears and exploitations are, is, are exactly what we are imposing on the other kingdom of nature. So we fear from others what, in fact, we are exercising on other kingdom of nature, which we consider them resources. Now, in that terms, stands very clearly our exploitative attitude towards those kingdoms. Now, that 
exploitative attitudes can change and will change in the moment in which we start considering ourselves also as resources for the other, for the other kingdoms. And also asking again ourselves what it takes to be a resource not only for my fellow human beings, but also a resource for the other kingdoms, try to ask myself the question, what is their purpose? You know, what, what is that they're trying to achieve? As a human being, probably I have a sense of what I want. As a collective, a little bit less. Okay, it's written in the UN Charter, I have an idea where we, we want it to go as, as humanity. But then, to ask myself the question, what's the purpose of the, of the animal kingdom? What is their evolutionary aim? What's the evolutionary aim of the vegetable kingdom or the mineral kingdoms or other kingdoms that exist on the planetary life? And ultimately, you know, what's the purpose of this planet and beyond? So it, it's, it's critical to ask ourselves the question because then we put into scale what we have been saying and what we mean when, in terms of uh, of cooperation. And it's a question that must be asked re consistently to ourselves. Fundamentally, so what does it take for me to be a resource? And, and I think that we need to build and develop that concept of cooperation across all kingdoms. In our minds, it's important to, to, to devote the time to create that, that idea practice it, and also keeping ourselves in, 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 in the strongest check because, you know, we make mistakes, so that's fine. But that is where the checks are actually useful so that we see if we are progressing according to the idea that we have been uh, creating and, 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 uh, and, and forming. Now, is this a way to help this process? I believe so. Now, tomorrow if, uh, is going to be the 100th anniversary of the end of War I. War uh, in uh, 1919, uh, at the Paris conference, uh, something very important happened. It was the founding of the League of Nations, the forerunner of the United Nations. But was, uh, what was particularly interesting in there, in that experience, is that another great thing was conceived which was the, the birth of international civil service. And uh, basically, the creation of a cadre of uh, servants whose job was to honor and serve the purpose of the agreement that the countries decided to have. It didn't exist before. It was also interesting, when I was, when I was telling my grandmother uh, that, that I wanted to do this job, of course, she was a little bit worried because she said, well, what's that? I mean, can't you be maybe a medical doctor or, you know, <laughs> something? Because it's true. I realized that she was born before international civil service was conceived. Again, this one is a quite new, is a quite new experiment. And of course, the idea of international civil service was then taken and further developed uh, uh, under the Charter of the United Nations, where the, the UN servants are expected to be instrument uh, of this collective will and the process uh, of harmonizing uh, the particular wills of nations and other stakeholders that contributes to the decision-making of the United Nations and support the application, the implementation, the realizations of that collective act of wills that takes the forms of a resolution of the Security Council, a resolution of the General Assembly, or in certain particular moment, the resolutions which adopt the, the, fa the most favored which is the SDGs that Steve always has. So, International civil servants are expected to be that instrument uh, to serve that purpose of Article 1.4 of the UN Charter to be 
a center for harmonizing the actions of nations. That what international civil servants are supposed to be. But let me be very clear about one thing, that international civil service is just a symbol of something much more important that had happened at that time and of a much larger significance, at least to my eyes, uh, which is the, I would say, an expression or an open call for people to willing, for people willing to serve a transpartisan interest and a su support a process which at the heart is a political process of harnessing individual wills into a collective will and direct that will toward a clear evolutionary plan for the earth. It was literally and still is a call to join the ranks. Now, 2019 is gonna be 100 years of international civil service and I really hope that this is an opportunity for actually mobilizing people of goodwill across the world, being more and more aware of the role that uh, is expected to be uh, played and in mobilizing this massive volume of will that is present and constantly emerging on, on the planet and directed toward the application of this planetary plan, which materialized, for instance, in the SDGs, the Sustainable Development uh, Goals. So these are, in my views, constitutional times. They're very important times where the use of imaginations is, is, is fundamental, not only logic, also imagination. We need to create the space that we want. Now, I don't think that this group, uh, of course, should be organized. It's fundamentally more of a, of a movement, but that should work probably around the same rhythm. And the rhythm is also the one that Mary was nicely describing uh, before in her presentation that affirms the importance of goodwill, that's critical, and in the, in the collective persons of this uh, plan for the benefit of not only for humanity, but also for the other kingdoms of, uh, of nature. Now here, and I'm reaching the, uh, my conclusions, now Doug Amashold, who is, was um, uh, the second Secretary General of the United Nations who died uh, uh, on the 18th of uh, September in 1961 in a dubious plane crash, and also uh, other colleagues uh, uh, lost their lives there, uh, when they were trying to broker um, uh, a peace agreement. Doug Amershaw has left uh, a, an incredible amount, uh, a, a body of knowledge and practice uh, uh, around international cooperation that is still uh, uh, probably not fully, uh, fully utilized. Because Doug Amershaw, what he did, in, to my eyes, uh, he dived uh, into international uh, relations uh, and tried very actively to transform them from pure coexistence uh, into international cooperation. That uh, is an agent of change. And I want really to stress the shift from international relations and coexistence to international cooperation in terms of wanted relations for the persons of something of common good and common interest. Hammarskjöld said that we were in a transitional time and that transition is not a transition of three years, it's a transition that will last probably decades, if not centuries. Uh, that doesn't mean that it's not worth engaging because it's, it's, it's so much larger than our, uh, and our lives. And that transition basically will be as effective as we are capable of embracing this ever widening reality that is around us. Relations widens the space where we live in. Our consciousness is constantly sucked out uh, to integrate all those dimensions. And that is a, quite an interesting, uh, um, I would say, uh, consciousness gymnastic 
this constant expanding and shrink in daily life uh, universe go back. Uh, and and in, in a way, it's precisely through cooperation that the common good uh, get constantly redefined and adjusted. But as we redefine the common goods, then also we are led to discover new forms of cooperation. And that is a very interesting virt virtuous, uh, uh, virtuous cycles. So what cooperation does, in a way, brings out, and this I'm using again Hammarskjöld idea, a, a new form of na new nationalism, where the best of individuals at the best of countries is brought out, leveraged, and harnessed toward the implementation of life on, on Earth. And I wish to conclude uh, with using Doug Hammarskjöld words, which I find are very cr critical or very focused on the task that we have at hand. He says, perhaps a future generation which knows the outcome of our present efforts will look at them with irony. They will see where we fumbled and they will, would find it difficult to understand why we did not see the direction more clearly and work more consistently toward the target it indicates. So it will always be. But let us hope that they will not find any reason to criticize us because of a lack of that combined steadfastness of purpose and flexibility of approach, which alone can guarantee that the possibilities which you are exploring will have been tested to the full. Working at the edge of development of human society is to work on the brink of the unknown. Much of what is done will one day prove to have been of little avail, but that is no excuse for the failure to act in accordance with our best understanding in recognition of its limit, but with faith in the ultimate result of the creative evolutions in which it is our privilege to cooperate. Thank you.